This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. UFC 305 coming up this weekend is Drikas Duplessis taking on Israel Adesanya. Should be a pretty fun main event where the betting markets are actually pretty tight at FanDuel Sportsbook for this one. We're going to talk to Austin Swain today, picking his brain on that main event, talking about stylistic matches for those two guys, his favorite bets there, but also top money lines and props across the rest of the card. This is Covering the Spread, a FanDuel Research podcast. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor at FanDuel Research, joined here as mentioned by Austin Swain. You can check him out on X at a Swain 3 He is a senior editor for us at FanDuel Research. Austin, happy Friday to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jim. This is an Austin Swain type of year. I got UFC 305 this weekend. We got fantasy football drafts commencing now and then week zero of college football next week. So pretty much everything that I love and adore is going on right here, including this awesome card. So I'm riding a little bit on cloud nine this morning. That's for yeah. sure. Week zero is making me a bit itchy because uh, they got the the Dublin game for uh, Georgia Tech, Florida State. Yeah, and I was at that the Dublin game two years ago. I'm like, oh, I could go back, you know, uh, not this year, but like I'm like, oh, I'm a little itchy to go back at this point. So yeah, that's gotten my my college football senses tingling pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like this should be an insane year in college football with all the restructuring and things like that. I can't wait to unwrap that. But like, I mean, I got to get through this weekend first because the matchmakers were in their bag. You said a lot of close fights. I think even some of the wider money lines you've got arguments for or against. So it should be a fun, exciting weekend of, of mixed martial arts. Well, that is a good tease. I'm excited for UFC 305. We'll break down the main event, talk about Austin's favorite bets across the card at FanDuel Sportsbook in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. couple of shows up now for this weekend's events. Broke down NFL preseason week two. My favorite bets there on yesterday's show. We also had Austin Cass on to preview this year in the English Premier League. Also talked about some bets he likes for match week one. To get both those shows and this one all these shows as they go live. Make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Search for Covering the Spread, hit subscribe. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating and review as well. Of course, these shows do go up over on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV Plus as well. The dog days are here, and the coolest place to get in on the MLB action is FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because this summer, FanDuel's looking up all customers. They boost for a bonus daily. That's right. There is something for everyone every day all summer long. You can score bigger winnings in any inning with profit boosts, snag bonus bets or home runs every Tuesday, and even beat the heat with no sweat bets. So head over to FanDuel and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball, must be 18 plus in D.C. and 21 plus in present and select states. Opt-in required. Wager requirements apply. Bonuses awarded as now withdrawable bonus bets or profit boost tokens. Restrict apply including bonus expiration see terms and conditions at fanduel.com slash sportsbook gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash rg in colorado dc iowa kentucky michigan new jersey north carolina ohio pennsylvania illinois tennessee vermont virginia and wyoming call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1 789 7777, or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1 809 with it in Indiana, 1 800 522 Visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1 877 770 Stop in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. Hope is here. Visit GamblingHelplineMA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Let's take a look now at the main event, Austin, for USC 305. Again, Duplessis taking on Izzy Adesanya. Before we talk about the markets, again, which are very tight, I just want to talk to you about how you see this fight stylistically. How What's the matchup for these two guys going toe-to-toe? Yeah, I, I mean, I've certainly heard arguments on both sides with this matchup. I actually think the more familiar style here is from the challenger. That's Israel Adesanya, known as the last style bender. He's been around the top of this middleweight division for a long time with his patient 
creative kickboxing game. Drake, Drake is Duplessis is kind of the new guy to the scene, even as the champion, but the data always loved this guy. I identified him as a contender because of how well he grades out in the spreadsheet, plus 1.72 striking success rate, aggressive, powerful boxer with mean kicks, um, wrestling-based efficiency, three takedowns per 15 minutes on 51% accuracy, even has a UFC win by sub and for submission attempts. So he can really do it all. I think even an Adesanya backer here would acknowledge that Duplessis is the more well-rounded fighter, but that really didn't stop Izzy in his prime. But now we get to a point that an inflection point that we get to a lot when it comes to MMA betting is aging. It does not work well in the sport. Median age of UFC champions is 30 years old. And now Adesanya is 35. He's coming off a fight where Adesanya was a minus 750 favorite against Sean Strickland. And he got blown out. Didn't win a single round, arguably. And Strickland just lost to Duplessis to give Drakus this belt anyway. So I see this as a fight where Duplessis can do it all. He's kind of a souped-up version of a Marvin Vittori matchup that Adesanya had in his prime for the OGs back in the day. Vittori kept things close. He went to a decision in both fights. And now Duplessis does things much, much better than Adesanya does. So it's no surprise to me this betting line is close. We'll talk about a little bit of the activity with the money line and why it sits where it is relative to where I have it. But I think that this is going to answer a lot of questions about what Izzy has in the tank left at 35. And as you alluded to, we have seen some movement in the markets because Adesanya was minus 122 yesterday. Now down to minus 114, Duplessis has shortened from minus 104 to minus 106. So based on the tone, it sounds like you're probably on Duplessis or am I reading that incorrectly? No, you're definitely not reading that incorrectly. In fact, um, I I've, I've, was going to not tell you this, but actually my largest money line bet I've ever placed on an individual fight, I hit this at open. Duplessis was plus 136. Um, it, he opened around that range, and now it's closed all the way down here to minus 106. So it makes me feel good that I'm at least not alone. Now, I have Duplessis modeled minus 195 here, and you could say I'm way off from the market. That's a huge difference, but... To me, this is kind of similar activity that I saw back in the day with Conor McGregor in his two fights against Dustin Poirier, where McGregor had this bloated minus 340 money line in that fight against Poirier. But I looked analytically, Poirier was the more efficient striker. He was the guy that had grappling upside. I didn't really understand it from an MMA perspective, but this is what happens in the market sometimes. Adesanya is the star. I'd argue maybe he's still the largest star in UFC as far as drawing power. Now, Alex Pereira is coming for that, um, a longtime rival of Israel Adesanya. But Adesanya is a guy, they feel like he's got this championship aura about him. He's going to get it back, but he's on the wrong side of the statistical prime for UFC fighters. He's kind of one-dimensional, lands for less than four significant strikes per minute. Like, we saw this new age of middleweight, Sean Strickland, completely blow out Adesanya. I don't think Adesanya is really in a good matchup against Duplessis here. Duplessis landed six takedowns against Sean Strickland, identical striking or takedown defense as Adesanya. I think Duplessis has a lot of different ways to win here. So it's not surprising I'd have got a wide money line result. I knew I was going to kind of model in that direction because Dreykus is such a star on the spreadsheet. Okay, so we're liking Duplessis at minus 106 on the money line for this matchup against Adesanya. It's reassuring to see the movement you've gotten in your favor over Absolutely. that time. But, you know, we'll see how things play out actually on the mat on Saturday. What about any props for this matchup? Yeah, the prop market, I think, is actually even more interesting because Duplessis bucked a career trend by not finishing Sean Strickland in his last fight. He had five of six early finishes before that. And you look at his finishing indicators, 0.77% knockdown rate. Not extremely high. He's more of a ground and pound type of threat. And then 0.8 submission attempts per 15 is good volume, but not great. I'm still leaning violence here because of the physical mismatch. You watch these two guys against each other. Duplessis is short. He's much stronger. He's much a different build than Adesanya, who's lanky at 6'4 and uses his length in kickboxing. I've got this fight plus uh, minus 136 to not start round four. It's plus 124 on FanDuel now. I've always struggled a little bit more in five rounders because a lot of the data that I use to kind of calculate length of fights comes from three round fights. So I struggle most in round five totals, but I have a general tenor for violence here. I think you could certainly lean toward the under, um, under four and a half rounds here sitting at minus 120 or do plus the inside the distance. If you like my models result, want to back Drykus is the guy who would finish this fight early. Um, I've got that about 46.2% likely. So plus 190 by KO TKO submission is another angle, but I generally lean violence here without nearly as much confidence. 
Okay, so the round betting, as you mentioned, or the total rounds, uh, four and a half is the total right now. You dealing towards under four and a half, currently minus 120 for that. So we're expecting Duplessis to control the fight, expecting, like you said, expecting violence. That phrase is very unique to UFC, and we'll see how things play out with the main event on Saturday. Let's take a look elsewhere on the card, Austin, starting off with money lines. Which other money lines stand out to you for UFC 305? For sure. And when I said the matchmakers were in their bag, I was talking about this fight on the main card here, which actually has kind of a wide money line in it. Um, but Dan Hooker's taking on Mateus Gamrot. This is sort of a title eliminator de facto. Gamrot has a win over the current lightweight title challenger. So we're right around the belt at one of UFC's deepest divisions. I like Dan Hooker here. Uh, he coming back, he's plus 260. That shortened a little bit overnight, which also made me feel a little better about myself. I think this is strength on strength, whereas Mateusz Gamera is an elite volume wrestler. 14.67 takedowns attempted per 15 minutes. Almost one per minute for Gamrot. And that's kind of a crazy volume when you consider the time that he'll spend on top if he lands them. He converts a decent 36% clip of those. But Dan Hooker, I argued last night on my YouTube show, I think maybe he's the hardest matchup in this top 15 for Gamrot because he's got an 80% takedown defense across 21 UFC fights. All We know that is good about Dan Hooker. He's defended 10 of the last 11 coming into this one. It is odd to me Gamrot is such a large favorite when Hooker has paths to win. He has two UFC guillotine chokes, which is a good counter to wrestling. And Mateusz Gamrot has been dropped with a knockdown in four of his last five fights, so his durability might be fleeting a little bit as he's on the wrong side of 30 as well. Hooker might spend a lot of time on bottom in this. He might have a hard time winning minutes, but I think Dan Hooker can absolutely have impactful moments that help him win this fight. At plus 260, I definitely endorse him when my model's closer to plus 150. So you mentioned Hooker potentially struggling to rack up points in this one. Does that make you consider going uh, Hooker by knockout or TKO in order to circumvent that? Or do you think the money line is the best route for betting Hooker here? It's a great point because I had this jotted down in my notes. The way MMA scoring criteria is shifting in 2024, judges are being educated to score fights differently. Gamrot's control-heavy style where he doesn't land a lot of significant strikes, just 3.09 per minute. That is being not rewarded by judges. They want striking. They want damage. So Hooker could land a big elbow. It could win him the entire round compared to a control wrestler. Gamrot's style is a little bit antiquated. It's hard to deal with for most people. So to a point where, okay, this guy's been in control the entire round. We have to give him the round. I think Hooker with his takedown defense, with his ability to land elbows, knees, things like that, could squeak rounds out. I still like taking the money line in order to compass a decision outcome. And that hooker money line is currently plus 260 at FanDuel Sportsbook uh, for that matchup. Any other money lines stand out to you across this card? Yeah, so we'll dive onto the prelims. I think this is certainly an intriguing one at um, Featherweight, which... uh, Definitely seems like the deepest division in UFC at the moment. Josh Culeabau is the local guy um, from New Zealand taking on Ricardo Ramos. And it's an interesting fight where what's doomed Ricardo Ramos in his last two fights, he was first round submitted, both of those by guillotine choke. I just said that it's a counter to wrestlers. That's what happened to Ramos, who is a wrestler. 3.02 takedowns per 15 minutes, 60% accuracy. The relief for him in this matchup is that Culeabau has just one career UFC submission attempt. Doesn't really t- tend to do that particularly well. I don't think Kulia is a guy that can carry a minus 150 price tag in this competitive range of featherweight because he doesn't really do anything particularly well. Negative 0.04 striking success rate, not a ton of power. In this fight, I expect Ramos to have success with his wrestling when Kulia Bao just gave up four takedowns in his last fight to lose it. 67% defense overall is average. I kind of like a dog shot here, and this is another one of those fights that's closed a little bit when Ricardo Ramos plus 136 on Sunday. He's now plus 122, so you may have missed the best of the number, but I've got this ostensibly a coin flip as far as a model result is concerned. I like the plus money here with Ricardo when what's doomed him in his last two fights, probably not an issue in this one. So as you mentioned earlier on, uh, the we got a lot, a lot of tight fights in this card, and back in a couple underdogs, maybe those lines should be even tighter, which makes uh, what should be a fun card across Saturday. Okay, so the money lines Austin likes besides Duplessis are Hooker at plus two sixty and Ricardo Ramos at plus one twenty two. Mm-hmm. What about props? Where are you seeing value there for UFC three hundred five? Yeah, absolutely. You and I were joking before the show. It feels like if I want a specific way to bet a fight, FanDuel always has something at the buffet for me, and that's no more evident than this fight on the early prelims. Jack Jenkins is taking on 
uh, Herbert Burns. Jenkins is a minus 800 favorite. So it's like, you don't think I'm going to end up betting this fight from a money line perspective. I don't know. It's, it's a given that Jenkins is potentially going to win in this spot. But if you scroll all the way down, that there's a specific way that I think is perfect to back Jack Jenkins if you still want to with his knockout TKO round combo here. Interesting dynamic where Herbert Burns is lost in the second round of each of his last three fights. The guy has about eight minutes of gas in the tank before he is completely stumbled, fatigued, ended up getting TKO'd in the second round. All three fights. It happens very consistently when Jack Jenkins is a guy that you know is not going to be a, a super powerful threat, doesn't have a UFC knockdown threat yet, and he doesn't have a submission attempt in over 55 minutes. So he doesn't really submit guys. He doesn't really have a lot of one-punch power for a first-round knockout. I love Jenkins to win by knockout in rounds two or three after Herbert Burns' endurance expires. Obviously wasn't able to model the small samples in this fight. Burns and Jenkins still kind of at the beginning of their career. But based on the tendencies we've seen so far, Jenkins not a submission guy. He's taken on an excellent jiu-jitsu player in Burns anyway. I'll take Jenkins to win by knockout or TKO in rounds two or three when really I think it's the only way he wins the fight. If this goes to if this goes the distance, maybe Burns length got the better of him. If this is over in round one, maybe he got submitted. So rather than lay that minus 800 money line, I love this bet for Jenkins at plus 160. So if you go to FanDuel Sportsbook, click on the Burns versus Jenkins match and then scroll down to KO versus TKO round combos under the popular tab. You can find Jack Jenkins to win by knockout or TKO in rounds two or three. That is plus 160. Again, taking advantage of the stamina issues Austin is citing for Herbert Burns in this matchup. Any other props you like for UFC 305? Yeah, so um, this is not for the faint of heart. I'm going back up under the main card with I think what UFC profiles is going to be kind of a knockout or bust heavyweight fight between Tai Tuivasa and Jarzinho Rosenstrike. I'm kind of going to go the other way, which is not, which is a little unnerving. I, I'm going to go with this fight to go the distance at plus 400. Now, heavyweight can be a coin flip where it's over in a minute or it ends up going all 15 minutes between two guys who are sweaty and afraid of each other's power. I'm leaning a little bit more this way when Taitu Ibasa has lost four in a row, could badly use a win. Both of these fighters' knockdown rates are over 1.8%. I think there's going to be some walking on eggshells here. And you say, well, I don't know how I feel about that. These guys are KO artists through and through. It is not unprecedented. Six of these two's combined 28 UFC fights have gone at least three rounds. That is 21.4%. Plus 400 odds here imply about 20% implied probability. So, I think it's a pretty good bargain. In fact, when you look at the low volume these two put out, I've got this fight modeled at 34% likely to go the distance. So it's not going to hit an overwhelming amount of the time, but I do think this is slightly undervalued because of reputation when how these guys match up actually against each other, there's not really an aggressor here. There's not really a guy that is wanting to go out there and land significant volume. It'll either be a brawl that's over in a minute, or I think if this fight is extended, it's got a great chance to go the distance. Is that uncommon for that weight class for it to be, like you said, where neither guy is typically super, super aggressive? Not not at all. So typically okay. it is a low volume late class. We've seen this. Uh, Derek Lewis and Francis Ngannou had a title eliminator fight years ago, 2019 on Halloween, that it went. It was maybe the worst UFC fight I've ever seen where <laughs> neither guy wanted to throw a punch. They were trepidatious of each other's power. The two most common results at heavyweight are a first round knockout or decision in that order. So typically it is one of those things where you have a, a pretty quick sweat. And then if it's not going to happen, then you get to a spot where it could end up going the distance because both guys mind their P's and Q's. And by the way, when endurance starts to become a factor, guys can't hit quite as hard. These are tough. These are tough guys. They have great chins. If that power is not coming back at full mass, usually they can survive to the distance. So it is a coin flip dynamic we see in heavyweight. It's always a risk to project it in an individual fight, but you know that's why I do this. And I'm looking at the volume here, and I think we maybe take our shot. Alrighty, so that is Tuivasa versus Rosenstrike to go the distance four to one at FanDuel Sportsbook in addition to the Jack Jenkins by knockout or TKO in rounds two or three. That's all we got for today. Breaking down UFC 305. Of course, Austin will have a betting guide over at FanDuel Research for this card. Also some DFS plays at FanDuel Research to find those. Go to FanDuel.com slash research and find Austin's work over there. Austin, appreciate the time as always. Enjoy UFC 305. We'll talk to you once again the very near future okay sounds good jim 
All right, you can find Austin on X at Swain 3 I'm on X at Jim Sonis. You can find FanDuel Research on X at FanDuel Research. Again, NFL and EPL stuff already up on the podcast feed, FanDuel TV Plus, and the FanDuel YouTube page. We'll talk to you all once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread, a FanDuel Research podcast. 